Um, you've come on a great day, whether you're a regular or whether you're here for the first time. We're in the middle of a series called Summer of Love, uh, which someone pointed out to me this morning sounds like a 1980s acid house compilation, but it's not. Uh, we're actually looking through John's first letter. He wrote three letters in the Bible, and we're looking through the first one. Um, before we do that, I just want to big up uh, Rod as well. Rod's been leading our service today. Uh, he was preaching to us last week. Rod's carrying his family through a, a pretty tricky bereavement at the moment, and he's uh, continuing to lead this church through the summer. He's teaching out of some of the stuff that he's going through so that we can all know how great God is in times of you know, difficulty and challenge. So I just want to honour Rod and just big him up. We might want to just give him a round of applause. Thank you, Rod. We think you're amazing. So we're looking at John's first letter, and you might want to follow that in the Bibles as we go through it. It's on page 1158. And John's writing this letter to some churches in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is an area which today is in uh, modern Turkey. And this is a church which at that time is being challenged. This is a church which at that time is struggling it's a church which has been established around the good news of the resurrection of Jesus. It's a church which has been built around God's word in the Bible. It's a church which has been built under the leadership of the men who've been appointed as apostles. But into the mix have come some other guys, some false teachers, who are teaching all sorts of stuff. They're people coming up with their own versions of who God is their own versions of what it means to know God, their own versions of what God wants from us, their own versions of what makes God happy, confusing times, much like today. And that raises a question for them. How can they know that they've got it right? How can we know that we've got it right? How can we be sure that we actually know the God who speaks in the Bible? How can we be certain? How can we have no doubt at all that we know God? And whether you're a follower of Jesus here today or whether you find yourself here and you're not sure what all of this is about, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. How can we be sure that we're not deceiving ourselves? As Hamish and Sam bring up Lewis to know God, how can they be sure that they've got it right? How can we all be sure that we know God? So before we look at this passage, I'm just going to pray for us and ask for God's help. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you're a God who speaks to us. We thank you for the baptism that we've seen this morning. We thank you for your generous welcome. We thank you that you're a God who opens your arms wide and asks us to come and know you, and welcomes us into your family. And Lord, as you speak to us this morning through your word, I pray that your Holy Spirit would be at work in our hearts, and in our minds, and in our lives, and that you would remind us, that you would remind us of the kind of God you are, and the kind of offer you're making to us. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, how can I be sure I know God? How can I really be sure I know God? Is it even possible to know God? If we look at the passage that we just heard, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3, John says, this is how we know that we've come to know him. This is how we know, verse 5, this is how we know we are in him. All the way through John's letter, this is how we know, because John wants us to be completely clear that we can know God. He wants us to be completely clear that we can know God. And this letter is full of language from the beginning of the Bible, it's full of language from Genesis, which is the first book of the Bible, because John wants us to know that he's talking about the God who is there at the beginning of the Bible, who speaks right in the opening pages, who existed in the beginning, who existed from the beginning. This is the God who spoke the word of life. This is the God who said, let there be light, and there was light. This is the God who created the universe, who flung the galaxies into place, who created all human life who created, ultimately, each of us here today, this morning. 
And John wants us to know that he is talking about this God. This is the God that we can know. This is the God that we can know. So John says we can know God. We can know God. And knowing God isn't just knowing stuff about God. It's not just opening the pages of the Bible and getting information about God. It's about knowing God as a person. John describes knowing God as being in God. He talks about having fellowship with God. He talks about being in the light with God. All these are ways of saying that knowing God is about having an intimate relationship with God. It's about knowing him personally. Having a relationship with him like you'd have with a good friend or with a brother or sister or with a, a parent. And the people in John's church have heard so many different opinions, so many different voices, so many different views at that time that some of them are no longer sure whether they know God or not. Some of them are no longer clear what would it mean to know God. And so in this passage that we've just looked at, John gives them three ways to be sure that they know God. He gives us three ways that we can be sure that we know God. Three tests that we can take, look at our lives, and know how we're doing, whether we know God or not. So here we go, the first thing. Number one, when you know God, your behavior changes. When you know God, your behavior changes, and you walk like Jesus John says, verse 5, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to be in him must live as Jesus did or walk as Jesus did, literally in the Greek. Walk as Jesus did. When we know God, our behavior changes. We start to do things the way that Jesus did them. We get to be generous the way that Jesus was generous. We get to hang out with disciples the way that Jesus hung out with disciples. We get to hang out with people who aren't disciples the way that Jesus hung out with people who were outside the church. We get to talk to God as our Father the way that Jesus talked to God as his Father. We get to do a whole load of new stuff. You know, it seems silly, but um, I became a Christian, I don't know, 11 or 12 years ago. But for years, I hung around on the edge of church. For ages, I hung around just outside the church, on the edge, just coming into the odd service. And it was, it was a while before I jumped in and fully got to know God. It was because I didn't want to give up a load of stuff. I didn't want to give up clubbing. I didn't want to give up doing mad stuff with motorbikes. And what I didn't realize at the time is that knowing God is actually far more exciting than any of that stuff. Knowing God is far more exciting than that. We just spent, in this church, we just spent a week away at a church holiday in Focus, called Focus. Uh, and we just had an amazing time. There were four and a half thousand other Christians there. We had a fantastic time worshipping God, getting to know God better. We had a fantastic time on the beach. We had a fantastic time eating too many barbecues. Uh, we had a fantastic time getting to know God and getting to know each other more. It was great. So when we say that we know God, we walk as Jesus did. When we say that we know God, the evidence is that we walk as Jesus did. And then there's the more personal stuff that God is changing as well. You know, the more personal stuff. So for me, before I started following Jesus, I was, I was actually really very selfish. I'm still quite selfish. But then I was really selfish. And one of the ways that that showed itself is I really liked to always be living on my own. I liked to have my own space, my own level of comfort. I liked my home to be the place where I could be, where I could be comfortable, that was organized around me. And now I find that I'm sharing with a bunch of guys from church, living with other people. I've got a ton of people in and out of my house all the time, and God is gradually changing me. It's fantastic. Slowly over time, our behavior changes when we get to know God. So I find I can be generous with my home. I can be generous with my money. I can be generous with my time walking more and more like Jesus. How can we be sure we know God? John says, firstly, when you know God, your behavior changes and you walk more like Jesus. And secondly, when you know God, your heart changes and you obey his commands. You keep his commands. 
Now, commands might sound like a bit of a negative word to lots of us here, yeah? It maybe has a bit of a negative response to that because it can sound as if God's just this kind of like arbitrary dictator who's telling us what to do. But actually, that's not the way it is. Actually, we were designed to follow God's purpose. It's not for nothing that John keeps reminding us who the God is that we're talking about. And he does it by pointing us back to the beginning of the Bible, by saying, in the beginning, from the beginning, this is the God who spoke the word of life, who said, let there be light, because he wants us to know that this is the God who designed us, who created us, who made us. So back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we read, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Other translations have to work it and keep it. And there's quite a lot going on there in that that expression, to keep it. If we dig down into the Hebrew, there's quite a lot going on. Because yes, it means that the first human beings were made to look after the garden, to look after the earth. But that word keep all through the Old Testament is used in the expression to keep God's commands. Because right at the beginning, there in Eden, before the fall, human beings were made to know God. We were made to know God. We were made to keep his commands. And that doesn't mean just that we were made to do as we were told. It means much, much more than that. It means that we were made to be the people that God would use to carry out his plans in creation. It means that we were made to carry out God's plans for his universe, to make the universe perfect. It means that we were made to be God's agents, to be God's representatives, carrying out his blueprint for the earth. And John says we know that we've come to know God if we keep his commands. And he's not just saying that if we love God, if we know God rather, we'll do what he tells us. Much more than that, he's saying if we know God, we'll know that he created the universe and that his plans are the best ones. And we want to be working with him. We want to be getting with his plan to make the earth the way that he's going to make it. Perfect. Perfect. So for me now, the question that I always ask before I do anything is, is how does this fit with God's plans to make the world perfect? How does this fit with God's plans to make the world perfect? Whether that's stuff to do with jobs, stuff to do with friendships, stuff to do with how I spend my time, how I spend my money. How does this fit with God's plans to make the world perfect? So it's not so much like being told what to do. Rather, it's more like, it's more like being a gardener or a farmer who's asked to look after the crops to get a fantastic yield, a fantastic harvest for the manager. Or again, maybe it's more like being a businessman who's asked to invest assets in a particular way for the king. Or again, maybe it's more like being a soldier asked to follow orders to achieve the aims of the commanding officer's mission. And all these examples haven't come from me. All these are illustrations that Jesus gave us to understand how to relate to God's commands, how to approach God's commands, how to keep God's commands. God wants to work through us to make the world perfect. So how can we be sure that we know God? Three things. When you know God, your behavior changes and you walk like Jesus. Secondly, when you know God, your heart changes and you want to keep his commands and get with his plan. And thirdly, when you know God, your relationships change and you love the brothers and sisters in the church. When you know God, you love the brothers and sisters in the church. John says, verse 9, those who claim to be in the light but hate a brother or sister are still in darkness. Those who love their brothers and sisters live in the light. So when John is talking about keeping God's commands, he's got one command right at the top of the pack. He's got one command right at the front of the queue that he's concerned about. 
It's an old command because it's been repeated everywhere that the followers of Jesus have been gathering as he writes this letter at this point 60 or 70 years. And it's a new command because it hasn't been given to God's people before Jesus showed up. And this is the command that John has in mind. It's from John's Gospel. Jesus says, chapter 13, A new command I give to you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Love one another. If we know God, we'll love our brothers and sisters in the church. And where do we see that love? How can we know what that looks like? John says we can see that in Jesus, verse 8. I'm writing you a new command to love one another, that is. I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him, in Jesus, and now in you. Its truth is seen in him and now in you. So when we really know God, we see the truth of the love that Jesus has for us. And that love isn't just that nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that the world calls love. This is hardcore love. This is the epicenter of love. This is love that's prepared to die for someone else. And we can't help but share this love with one another. And I see that love in this church. I see that love in our community when people go out of their way to get around people who are struggling with life, who are ill, who are suffering miscarriages or struggling with debt or struggling with other stuff that life's thrown at them. I see that love in action in this church. I see that love in action in this church when people give generously to those who are financially less well off, even when it means hardship for themselves. I see that. It's love in action. I see that love in this church when people commit to sharing life with each other in connect groups and in prayer groups and in families and in households, coming together to do life with their brothers and sisters, not because we're all such great people, though we are, but because we love Jesus and we love his church. So this is how we can be sure that we know God when all of these things are happening in our lives. This is the massive impact that knowing God has on your life. And this is how you can be sure that you know God. First of all, your behavior changes. You walk like Jesus. Secondly, your heart changes and you keep his commands. And thirdly, your relationships change and you love your brothers and sisters in the church. And when we know God, these are the things that he promises to do. These are the things that he promises to do through us and in us. He promises to make us people who are more like Jesus when we know him. He promises to make us people who work for God's agenda in our lives to make the world perfect when we know him. And he promises to make us people who love one another, who love one another when we know him him and the amazing thing is that God wants us to know him the amazing thing is that God wants us to know him he hands himself over to be known he hands himself over to be known and sometimes as he hands himself over we laugh at him Sometimes as he hands himself over, we we spit at him and we, we disdain what he's offering. Sometimes as he hands himself over to us, we're just using as the whipping boy for anything that might be going wrong in our lives at that time and we need someone to blame. And sometimes we just go the whole hog and we crucify him because we don't really want him to exist. And you know what? God keeps taking it all. He just takes it all. He just takes it all. He just keeps taking everything that we throw at him because he doesn't want there to be anything that comes between us and him. He doesn't want there to be anything to stop us from knowing him. He hands himself over to be known. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know him because to know God is to trust God. To know God is to love God. To know God is to delight in God to celebrate God. 
God wants us to know him. He wants us to know him. Shall we stand together?